this morning. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that your word is alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. Your word, Lord, causes life in us. Your word, Lord, convinces of righteousness and convicts of sinfulness and lawlessness and unrighteousness. And so, Lord, may we look into your word this morning as a mirror and see ourselves and see uh, the unworthiness in our own lives, Lord, reflected back at us. But may we also see the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ that we as believers share. Thank you this morning, Lord, that you have changed us and transformed us and we're becoming more and more like your son Jesus every day. And all of God's people thanked God and said, Amen. Amen. Let's give him a praise one more time before we're seated. Amen. This morning I want to continue uh, talking about this great nation, the exceptional, exceptionalism of this land. Thank you, Sister Janet, for this cup of water. All right. You know what they say about offering a cup of water in the name of the Lord, don't you? There's a great reward for that. Thank you, Janet. Um, and so uh, this morning, I want to continue uh, the thought that America is an exceptional nation. America is an exceptional nation. The reason America is exceptional, I'm going to give you at least three reasons this morning why I believe America is great and exceptional. Um, but every one of those is based in the Word of God. We begin by studying Psalm 33 and 12, where the Bible declares, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. There is blessing attached to following God. When you follow God as a nation, you're blessed. When you follow God as a people, you're blessed. When you follow God as a family, there's blessing attached. When you follow God as an individual, there's blessing. But the other side of that coin is when you're not following God, when you're not trusting Him, and you're not putting Him first, the blessings of God are not there. Then the Bible goes on to say the people that He chose for His inheritance are blessed. Then I look at Proverbs 14 and 34 that I would like to direct your attention to. The Scripture says, righteousness exalts a nation. You know what it means to exalt? To exalt something means when you exalt something, you lift it up high. You, you magnify it. You make it great. Righteousness makes America a great nation. It's righteousness. It's, it's right standing with God. When we are no longer righteous, we're no longer great. Alexis de Tuville was a French historian who came to this country over 100 years ago. He came to visit America and determine what made America great. He went to our factories and he saw that we, were, uh, we could produce tremendous things uh, in, our, in our manufacturing world, he went to the farms and saw tremendous uh, fields of grain and wheat and barley and, uh, and, and all the things, the crops that we produce in our nation. But he realized that wasn't what made America great. He went into our courtrooms and he heard um, orators, the, the, the attorneys speaking and the judges ruling, but he determined that wasn't what made, made America great. It was only when he went to a church and he heard the gospel of Jesus Christ being proclaimed from a pulpit like this, and a fire in the congregation, and a fire of the Spirit, that he realized that's what made America great. And he said these words. He wrote these words down. He says, America is great because America is good. He said, if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. Uh, and that's exactly what the Scriptures say. It's righteousness that exalts a nation. And sin condemns any people. In the history of this country, we have had a, a number of tremendous things that have transpired. I want to just talk about a few of those this morning and just kind of share with you a little bit as we continue our thought of, of uh, how great America is. And I love, by the way, I love these flags on the stage. If it was up to me, we'd leave flags up year-round because I like them. I'm a patriot. I bleed red, white, and blue. Amen? And so I love it. I love it. It's great. Here are a couple of things. In, for instance, in 1816... Um, the chief justice of the Supreme Court was, was a man by the name of John Jay. He was the very first Supreme Court uh, justice, the chief justice. He was often called the father of the Supreme Court. He was the, one of the primary writers of our Constitution. And he wrote this quote in 1816 in a letter. And he said, divine providence. Now you've got to understand, divine providence is God. 
He said, God has given to our people the choice of the rulers. And it is the duty of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. Wow. Another, another interesting uh, quote from, from the state of Delaware in, um, oh, let's see, what year was this? It doesn't say exactly what year it was, but here's the quote. It goes something like this. Inquiries um, by our reporters. Now, this is not the quote. This is a thought that a reporter is picking up this story. Here's, here's the thought. A reporter picks up the story from a state legislature passing a law requiring all elected officials to take an oath. Now, here's the oath. I want you to hear the oath and you tell me how it sounds. I do profess faith in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ His Son, and I do acknowledge the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be given by divine inspiration. Did you realize that in the state of Delaware and most other states as well, they required office holders to take an oath? <coughs> There we go. I think we're done. To, to take an oath. <laughs> and the oath would affirm their Christian faith before they could take office. I just read it to you. I profess faith in God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. I acknowledge the Holy Scriptures as given by divine inspiration. How many of you would agree it would be a lot different in Washington, D.C. if every one of our politicians were to take that oath? Man. So this is part of what our nation was like. Do you realize that in 1782, Congress approved the use of the Bible in our schools? And they even approved uh, paying for the Bibles with tax dollars. And then in 1844, somebody came along and sued to remove the Bible. Now, doesn't that sound like today? 1844, somebody said, we need to remove, the, remove those Bibles. And the Supreme Court ruled, and here's the ruling. Why shouldn't the Bible, and especially the New Testament, be read and taught as a divine revelation in the schools? Where can the purest principles of morality be learned so clearly and so perfectly as from the New Testament? If you agree with that question, say a good amen. I read recently, in fact, I believe it was this last week, that the governor of the state of Kentucky signed legislation allowing the teaching of the Bible in public schools in the state of Kentucky. And I said, thank you, Jesus. Amen. But you want to know something that crossed my mind when I read that? I thought, why does it take a bill written by the governor and, and passed by the legislature and signed to, to make something happen that used to happen in our schools when this boy was a kid 50 years ago? We used to read our Bibles in schools, but we've taken that Bible out, and it's not right, ladies and gentlemen. Listen, the Bible is what we need to be teaching to children. We need to be teaching them from the time they wake up in the morning till they go to bed at night. We need to explain the Word of God and share the Word of God with children and grandchildren in the church and in the school and everywhere we possibly can so that our lives may be changed and society may be strengthened. Say amen, somebody. So the founders of our nation then... We, we, don't know all, we don't know everything about uh, the early history, but we do know some. And if you don't hear what I'm talking about today in church, where are you going to hear it? Our school systems, our universities have become so secularized that information about the spiritual heritage of America are often neglected. So much so that people now say, well, you know, America's not a Christian nation. Well, you know, America's not an exceptional nation. Well, you know, America's just on the same level of all other nations. And to that, I take, I, I, I said, no, wait just a minute. You cannot declare that because God has established this land to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. That's why God placed us on these shores. And as long as we continue to preach the gospel, we're going to continue to prosper. We're going to continue to go forward. But the moment we turn our back from God, the moment that we teach other things other than the Word of God, my friend, we will find ourselves in a quagmire of sin and destruction and degradation like we're seeing in our culture today. It's time that God's people turn it around. It's time that God's people take the Word and teach the Word and live the Word can you say amen, somebody? One of the first things that's so great about our country, I'll share three with you. Number one, 
is that America was settled by people looking for religious freedom. Our very earliest settlers were people who came here primarily looking for freedom of religion. Most other nations came into existence by conquest. They came into existence for selfish motives. But it was primarily in the atmosphere of God, not gold, but God, that America was born. Last week I, I told you of the, um, of the, the ship that sailed and uh, in the 1700s, and I told you of, of the gentleman by the name of Winthrop who preached the sermon called A City on a Hill. And he said that we've been established as a city on the hill. He took his text from, from uh, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, you're the light of the world. He said, you don't take a light and put a, a bushel basket over it. You set a light up on a hill so people can see it. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, we are the city on the hill. And they devoted themselves to that. And that was the thought. That was why they came. Then those who sailed in 1620 on the Mayflower, they, they, they fled oppression and tyranny. And in the Mayflower Compact, which they, they signed, it was a document signed beneath the swinging lantern in the cabin of the old ship coming across the ocean. They proclaimed that they had come to the new world, now get this, for the glory of God and for the advancement of the Christian faith. Did you know that was in our American history? Did you know that the Mayflower Compact contains those words? So in the early colonies, the first public building was a church. The worship of God Almighty was the first public act when people came together. When sorrow came, they gathered at the church to appeal to God for help. When their barns were filled with a, plant, a, a bountiful harvest, they came to the church and they offered thanksgiving to God, did our early forefathers in this country. In 1643, as more and more people began to arrive on these shores, they joined together and formed what's called the New England Confederation. The New England Confederation. They wrote the first constitution in the new world. The first constitution in this country. Here's how it began. Whereas we all came into these parts with one and the same end and aim, namely to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy the liberties of the gospel in purity and in peace. Did you know that was, that was part of the very first constitution? They acknowledged why they were here. They put it in writing for us now four or five hundred years later to read these words. That they came here to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, is it any wonder why God has blessed this nation as he has because we're here to preach the gospel? These are our spiritual forefathers who came to the shores of this nation, came so they could worship and they could practice their faith without fear of persecution. So, so that's the first thing that's right with America is the early settlers came looking for religious freedom. Number two, the second thing that's right about America is our founders had a strong desire to be pleasing to God and to do His will. To do His will. Now I realize that there are about 150 years that passed from the time of the earliest settlers to the beginning of our nation in 1776, which we are celebrating this week, July 4th, the signing of the Declaration of Independence, 1776. About 150 years passed from the original settlers coming till that time. And as the original settlers died off, many of their descendants were more concerned with increasing their wealth and making their lives comfortable than they were being faithful to the God who'd sent them. As wave after wave of immigrants arrived, many of them came for other reasons, with entirely different motives than our earliest settlers. For instance, England began a program of emptying its prisons and sending the prisoners to the new world as indentured servants. At the same time, the King of England was giving vast portions of land to his special friends. And slavery was introduced. Long before African slavery transpired, slavery was introduced into the colonies for these indentured servants to work the plantations. And the spiritual atmosphere deteriorated rapidly in that 150 years. Churches started dying, and many of them that had 
once sought religious freedom from themselves were now being intolerant of others. It was during this time that some went off in strange spiritual directions. For instance, in Salem, Massachusetts, you may have heard of a, uh, of a story. In 1692, a little slave girl was brought by her master to live in Salem, Massachusetts. She began to tell young girls there wild tales, vivid, imaginatory, imaginatory stories about the power of voodoo. It wasn't long until fear filled the community, beginning the Salem witch trials. You've read about in your history book. The end result of that and all of this was that by 1730, only about 10% of the people in the colonies attended church at all. In other words, that which had begun for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith had almost disappeared from our land. Now, if that sounds familiar, it should, because that's what we look like today. That's what we sound like today. We're more interested in prosperity. We're more interested in our comfort. We're more interested in, in, God, in ungodly gain than we are in serving God. We're more interested in all those things than the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. And many of those negative stories from our early history comes out of this period. But then something amazing happened. And this is what I want you to focus in on this morning. In 1734, a handful of preachers began to preach in churches and they began to preach in streets and they began to preach in the fields and people came to them, men like Jonathan Edwards, men like George Whitefield, men like Gilbert Tennant, men like John Wesley. Soon... These meetings turned into great crusades and great revivals, and they spread throughout the 13 colonies. So many people came to Christ that it became known, that era became known as the Great Awakening. Put that in your notes, would you? The Great Awakening. Tens of thousands dedicated their lives to Jesus and were baptized. So many people came to hear Whitefield as he traveled the colonies. He had to hold open-air meetings because there was not enough room in the churches. I said there was not enough room in the churches to contain the people during the preaching of Whitefield and the Great Awakening. And I said, oh God, give us another Great Awakening. I said, Lord, do it again in our time. I said, Lord, pour out your spirit in aid Oklahoma so we see a revival so great we can't even contain them in the church houses. Somebody say amen. Benjamin Franklin wrote of this time, and I quote, it was wonderful to see the change soon made in the man manners of our inhabitants. From being thoughtless and indifferent about religion, it seemed as if the whole world were growing religious, Ben Franklin, <laughs> so that one could not walk through the town in an evening without hearing psalms being sung in different families in every street. Oh, I'm telling you, friend, listen, Philadelphia was shaken. All of New England was shaken with the gospel during this time called the Great Awakening. In fact, Benjamin Franklin was so impressed with Whitefield's preaching that he built an auditorium to accommodate the crowds. The auditorium seated 5,000 people. You see, the crowds were reaching about 30,000 that Edwards was preaching to. Whitefield's preaching was just about that large as well. In fact, the Philadelphia had a population of only 25,000 people at that time, but larger crowds than the whole population of the city were coming from everywhere to hear these preachers preach. It wasn't just in Philadelphia, it was throughout all 13 colonies. So much so that devout Christians were no longer just 10% of the population, but in a short period of time they grew to make up 50% of the population. You see, here's what I want you to focus in on. This great awakening was the precursor to the American Revolution. You'll not read that in your history books. You'll not hear that from, from most of your teachers. We don't understand that it was, it was a move of God. It was a revival in the colonies that, that, that fostered this incredible revolution that we celebrate every time we shoot fireworks into the air. Our founding fathers, the signers of the Declaration of Independence, those who wrote the Constitution, those who wrote the Bill of Rights, those who put their lives on the line, who fought and died that we might be free, all of these came into leadership while this great awakening was engulfing the land. Hear this. The generation that experienced the great awakening became the leaders of the American Revolution. 
George Washington, it was recorded in his personal diary, in his own handwriting, this prayer. Now listen, I want you to listen to the words of this prayer. Tell me about this man's faith or lack thereof. Listen. Let my heart, gracious God, be so affected with your glory and majesty that I may discharge those weighty duties which thou requirest of me. Again, I have called on thee for pardon and forgiveness of sins, for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ offered on the cross for me. Thou gavest thy son to die for me, and thou hast given me assurance of my salvation. Now listen, George Washington was, according to his own handwriting, was a devout Christian. And he wasn't alone in his faith. He wasn't alone. Over a 10-year period, several years ago, political science professors at the University of Houston collected and cataloged writings of the Founding Fathers. 15,000 writings by the Founding Fathers. Their goal was to determine the primary source of ideas behind the Constitution by identifying the sources quoted most often. In other words, if, if I'm a writer of the Constitution and, and now hundreds of years later, political science uh, professors and journalists and students are going to research and they're going to find out what it was that prompted me. What, were the, what, were the, what, inspired, what quotes inspired me to be a writer of the Constitution? And they analyzed 15,000 writings. You may have to write that down to remember that. 15,000 writings by the Founding Fathers. Now, I want you to just, mm, just take a guess, okay? I'm going to give you a clue. It has five letters in it. But I want to give you a guess as to what the primary source of those 15,000 documents was. What is it that, that, that was the source of what inspired these men who wrote these incredible words for our country can anyone take a guess at what it was? It was the Bible. Listen to this. 94% of the quotes of the founders of our nation were based on the Bible. Well, yeah, preacher, but don't you know that none, they were all secularists and none of them believed the Bible and none, none of them were real true Christians and, and they had this issue and that problem and we're not really, we weren't really founded on Christian principles. Listen, that's not, that's not what I'm sharing this with you this morning. I'm just simply sharing with you some information you can Google and find for yourself. It's in, it's, it's in our history. Well, it's not in our history books anymore. It used to be in our history books, but God has founded this nation and, and has inspired men to study the Word of God. And from the Word of God, they were inspired to, to write all the great documents of this land that still exist today. Our Constitution our Declaration of Independence, our Bill of Rights, hundreds of years later, still some of the greatest documents ever written. So these men and women, founders of our country, were men and women who sought to please God and to do His will, point number two. Now that leads me to point number three. Point number three. <clears throat> America was founded by men and women who acknowledge God's supreme rule over men and over nations. And I think this is the third thing that is right with America. One of the, there's a thousand reasons. I'm just giving you three this morning. But this is one of the reasons why I believe America is exceptional. America was founded by men and women who acknowledge God's rule over men and over nations. They weren't perfect. No, they weren't. They weren't all devout Christians. I understand. I realize that. But they acknowledged that God was the supreme ruler over man. I'm going to read to you um, some words, and I think you'll recognize them. I'll tell you where they came from in a moment. In a moment. <clears throat> Here it is. Quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Does that sound familiar? That's the Declaration of Independence. That's the prologue. To, in, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. In other words... We want a form of government whose job it is 
to protect what the Creator has given to each of us. Then they went on in their Declaration of Independence, they listed a series of charges against the actions of the King of England, King George. And then they made two more references to God. They said, we, the representatives of the United States of America, wow, this had never been stated before. This is all brand new. In general, Congress assembled appealing to the supreme judge of the world. Who are they talking about? They're saying God is the supreme judge of the world. And then they end the declaration with these words and for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. Ladies and gentlemen, that's God. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Wow. I'm going to say that backwards. Wow. (laughs) Maybe you've seen a, a painting of the First Continental Congress. Many of you have heard the story of how they were debating the Declaration of Independence, and finally someone suggested, guys, why don't we all just get on our knees and ask God what should be done? And these framers of the Declaration of Independence all went to their knees as one man, and they began to seek the wisdom and the guidance of God. John Adams, in a letter he wrote to his wife, Abigail, about this meeting, the First Continental Congress meeting, he said the most amazing thing happened. Even the stern old Quakers had tears gushing down their cheeks as we prayed. Wouldn't it be wonderful today if our president and our Congress and our Supreme Court would just get down on their knees like our forefathers did and ask, God, what do you want for this nation? Oh, preacher, don't you know that'll never happen. They're hard, they're mean, it's a swamp, it's a secular country, it'll never happen. Listen, I still serve a God of miracles. We sang of a God of miracles this morning. Come on, is anything too difficult for Him? He can turn this nation around. He can put people in in power that need to be in power. He can touch the hearts of those who are in power, and He can change them, and He can move them and cause them to be be, uh, open to His ways. The writer of the Proverbs says that, that, that God has, the Lord has the heart of the king in His hand. You ever read that? The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And he moves it whithersoever he will. Like a river, he moves the heart. That's why we should always realize, listen, the king there is is those in authority. It's the person in authority. Could be your employer. Could be your boss. Could be the government. Whoever's in authority over you. Your your superintendent or the teacher. Whoever is the the authority figure, God holds the authority figure's heart in his hand. And he moves it like a river. You know how rivers move? They move with time and they move with pressure. You move a river with time and you move a river with pressure. And God takes time and pressure as we pray for those in authority. That's why we're commanded to pray for those in authority over us. That's why we're commanded to pray for our president. That's why we're commanded by Scripture to pray for for mayors and for governors and for all of those who are in authority over us. That we may live peaceable lives. You know why we can live peaceable lives? Because if we will pray for them, God will move their hearts. Oh, preacher, you don't understand how hard their heart is. I don't care how hard their heart is. God specializes in moving the hardest of hearts and softening them up. Can you say amen? I mean, look in the mirror. Look how hard your heart used to be. You remember better than anybody what you used to be like. But he's changed you. And he's continually changing us from glory to glory. He's changing us. And God, what do you want for this nation? Oh, God, put them on their knees again, I pray. I remember after 9-11, just like a few days after 9-11, some of you remember this. Our TV cameras were focused on the, on the front steps of, of Congress. And out on the front steps came all the members of Congress, all 435 members of the House of Representatives and 100 members of Senate. I believe that's right, 535. Vice President was there, President, everybody, everybody was there. Everybody was there. They were all there. And they linked arms. (laughs) And they prayed for America. 
It, it wasn't a partisan thing, man. It was a, it was a United States, it was an American, it was an America that was united again for one purpose. What was the sad thing was it took a destructive act that killed three, over 3,000 Americans to bring us all together. I don't know what it's going to take this time. I don't know what God's going to, going to do. I don't know what God's going to allow. I don't know what's going to happen in our country. But I do know it's time that we as a church pray for those in leadership over us and that we believe God for revival. Somebody say amen. At the signing of the Declaration of Independence, Samuel Adams is often called the father of the revolution. You thought Sam Adams was just a beard, didn't you? He was really the father of the revolution. He declared this, and I quote, We have this day restored the sovereign to whom all men ought to be obedient. He reigns in heaven, and from the rising to the setting of the sun, let his kingdom come. That's what he declared when they signed the Declaration of Independence. Today, we have restored the sovereign, we have restored God to his proper place in this land. We're saying, God, we want to be obedient to you. You reign in the heavens. And we pray your kingdom come. Woohoo! <laughs> Man, these guys were downright religious, weren't they? So that's the third thing that's right with this country. America was founded by men and women who acknowledged God's supreme rule over men and over nations. I believe that America was. Not only these wonderful things I've shared with you, but in closing this morning, I believe America was protected by God from the very beginning. You remember the British Empire was, at that time, they possessed the greatest, most powerful fighting force on the face of the earth. They had ships, they had red-coated trained uh, soldiers, they had uh, mercenaries that they had hired, they even hired Indians to fight against us. That had an air force back in those days. That had an air force. <laughs> we were just volunteers. We were farmers and tradesmen. We composed the ranks of the Continental Army. Most of us didn't even have uniforms that matched. We were outmanned. We were outgunned. We were outfinanced. And only a miracle could have brought success. And I want to say to you that miracle after miracle transpired to bring about success so that we could win our independence so that we could continue to be a city on a hill. So we continue to preach the gospel. Guys, listen, that's why we're here. That's why we're here. Let's get our heads out of the sand. Let's get our eyes off of chasing everything else. Let's realize it's about God. It's about His glory. It's about Jesus. Stand with me, please, would you? Washington, D.C., there is a, the tallest structure is the Washington Monument. And uh, by law, there can be nothing taller than the monument because um, that's the first thing the sun appears on and rises from the east of Washington, D.C. There could be no, mon no, no building taller than the monument so everyone can see the monument. And um, when you go up the stairs going up into that monument, there are certain places you can stop and there are scriptures that are written there. Just, just to remind you why we're here. And at the very pinnacle, underneath the, the capstone, I don't know, hundreds of feet in the air, under the capstone, if you were to take the capstone off and look, written there is an inscription that says, let God be praised. Let God be praised. Let God be praised. Let God be praised. If God is to be praised, the first thing when the sun comes over the our nation's capital. And that's the first thing God sees when the sun comes up. You can see without the sun, please understand. But, but, but my point is, that's, that was our purpose. Our, our emphasis was to say, Lord, we want your will to be done. We want you to be praised in this nation. It starts with us, the church. It starts with us, the church. Our heads bow, please, our eyes closed. Father, this morning, we thank you now this great land, this great nation, this, um, this American experiment, a republic that has, been, that has been built by the people, for the people, and of the people. An experiment like no other. A land that people are, are, are climbing walls and swimming rivers to get into because of our greatness. 
a land that is accepted and made welcome the peoples of the nation, uh, the people of, of the world, and continues to do so legally, like a million a year, we, we welcome into this nation who come legally as immigrants. Because all of us are immigrants. None of us, very few of us were born here on this land. We all come here, Lord, for one purpose. That's to, to further the kingdom of God, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We acknowledge, Lord, that's why you have allowed us to be the great nation we are, to support mission works around the world more than any other nation. To send missionaries and send money and build hospitals and clinics, universities, churches, feed the hungry, build houses for the homeless. God, you've blessed this land. We say thank you. We say, Lord, continue in this country. Continue to do your work, we pray.